Next, we're going to look at semantics and how we learn semantic representations. As we mentioned before, we think in the real brain, a lot of semantics is based on a rich some, uh, sensory motor experience of the world. But uh, in this case, we're just going to look at a really simple idea that you can use the statistics of co-occurrence of words uh, to infer the meaning of individual words. And so this is this idea that you can infer the meaning of a word based on the company that it keeps. And this was originally pioneered in the latent semantic analysis model, LSA. Um, and they used a particular mathematical technique to try to extract the neighborhoods of uh, words and get the meaning from that. But it turned out that that mathematical technique is similar to Hebbian learning, produces a principal components analysis like property as we see from uh, Hebbian learning models. And so it's really the same idea as our V1 receptive field model that uh, if you have a simple kind of Hebbian self-organizing process, it can extract these uh, statistics of co-occurrence. And those resulting high dimensional vector representations in the model end up providing a remarkably good representation of the meaning of words. And uh, in fact, these models have been used um, in various applications, including automatic essay grading. Uh, so some of your essays may have been graded by just such an algorithm, in addition to a lot of other heuristics that they apply. The core of it is kind of comparing the content of what people write based on using good uh, combinations of words to capture the meaning uh, in comparison to expert graded papers as, as a point of reference. So here's the network here. We're presenting uh, as the input uh, the collection of words that were all present together in a single paragraph in the textbook that you, in fact, are reading. This is um, an, an early version, actually, of the original edition of the textbook. Uh, and so uh, not exactly the same textbook that you're reading, but it has a lot of similar kind of content. And so uh, you have uh, individual units representing individual words and in the input. The combination of those, of those words then reflects the, the uh, total kind of meaning of a paragraph. The hidden layer just does uh, standard self-organizing BCM, heavy in learning, changing its weights, in combination to represent these uh, different word patterns. So we just present lots and lots and lots of different paragraphs over and over again. And by doing this heavy in learning, the network is kind of automatically extracting the principal components uh, of correlation across those words. And that is our clue to meaning. So we can open the synaptic weights and we can look at the individual synaptic connections and what we see is what a mess we don't know what that is what does that mean this is just a whole you know random looking pattern of synaptic connections and so this presents an additional challenge relative to the visual model where you can actually use your visual system to see what knowledge the model has represented here, we have to get a little bit of extra help to decode what, what knowledge is in here. One thing you can see is that there tend to be these repetitions among the uh, units. And we'll see when we look at this, if we click this weight words, we get a window that tells us all the words that are above 0.75 in synaptic weight strength uh, for that selected unit. And what you can see very clearly is that a lot of different synonyms are present in that uh, representation. So act, activate, activated, activates, activating, activations, acts, all of those things uh, all have basically very similar kind of meaning about activation. And the network has somehow managed to group those all together. And so you can see that in the synaptic input patterns in the network, by virtue of the fact that those are all alphabetically arranged. And so these kind of little streaks or lines in the input tell you that the network is picking up on those kind of synonyms. So that's one check. But it is a little bit difficult to, to sort of understand, well, how do we know what this model knows? How do we really assess its knowledge 
uh, these words, when we look at them, sort of have some of those meanings, but doesn't really hang together. Affect, again, already. How does that have to do with activation? Uh, importance, inconsistent, indicating. There's a bunch of, again, synonyms there about indication. Novel, note, new. What, is this, what does this unit mean? And this is really in a very important point that the uh, space of semantics is very high dimensional. And it's very hard to know like what an individual unit should represent. And in particular, when we look at, at these ones that, that it's learned, it's very hard to say that that makes any sense at all. And this is because each individual unit is essentially carving a very sort of strange hyperplane through this high dimensional space of semantics and extracting some kind of, you know, local, locally relevant kind of coherent spaces in there. But overall, the individual neurons in the model probably don't have a lot of systematic meaning. Instead, the meaning in this model comes from the patterns of activity across the neurons in the layer itself. And so if you go back to thinking about chapter three, we talked about distributed representations. This is a classic example of distributed representations and where in fact the distributed representation is the only thing that makes sense. So now what we need to do is somehow see what information is present in this distributed pattern of activity and see if that makes more sense. And to do that, what we can do is actually compare the pattern of activity that we get for different sentences or individual words. And that's what we're doing here. We've got these two words, attention and binding. So to test the distributed representations, you can hit this button, test all. It runs the network for these two different uh, sets of words. Here we're just testing two individual words. We can rewind here. This is the pattern of activity for attention. Uh, one of my old colleagues who developed the latent semantic analysis approach, Tom Landauer, liked to show the example of presenting the word life and showing the distributed pattern of activity there as the meaning of life. Um, in that model it was. And here's the pattern of activity for binding. And uh, you can kind of see that there was some overlap there. We can look at the test epoch plot. And this tells us that cosine value, uh, maybe close to 0.4, a little bit above 0.4, um, for those two words compared to each other. So it turns out that that's actually a pretty high value. Cosine goes from 0 to 1. 0 is unrelated. You can actually get negative ones in this case. Um, but uh, zero is unrelated and uh, one is related and given the high dimensional nature of the representation a 0.4 is actually quite a high level of overlap. We can now try out a different uh, pattern here um, and try binding and object recognition and test those and we can see that we get a higher cosine. So there's more, uh, you know, kind of relationship between the concept of binding and object recognition than there is for binding and attention. Um, and we can add feature binding to binding here and potentially even increase that higher. So we're talking about the need to bind together the different features to distinguish different objects and we get even a higher level of overlap. So this is a, a demonstration that by sort of tailoring things we can see that words that we think should be related are related and combinations of words are even more closely related. We can compare just having subsets of words. So what does it look like when we just have features? It's not as strong as um, having binding plus features. So having that combination, that concept that, that connects those two is actually a, itself a, a form of binding um, is important for uh, driving the, the overall pattern of activity. You can uh, kind of contrast that with other things. So hippocampus which is memory binding, but we're going to compare it with object recognition. 
and you can see that that drops the similarity down quite a bit. Um, so there isn't as much kind of association between object recognition and the hippocampus as there is with feature binding. On the other hand, there is an association between the hippocampus and binding. It's a different sense of uh, binding, even though object recognition and hippocampus are not closely related, there is more of a uh, relationship between binding and the hippocampus. So overall, when you probe it this way, especially in the context of the content of this course, uh, in general, it seems to exhibit pretty uh, sensible kinds of patterns. One final thing we can do is quiz the network. This is one of the standard tests that's been done with, with the LSA models. So you basically run a set of questions uh, with the multiple choice answers and you say which of these basically multiple choice answers provides a pattern of activity in the hidden layer that's closest to the overall uh, question pattern of activity. And um, so that's a plot that we get here looking at the relationship between the first answer, the second answer, and the third answer for each of the different questions. And we've rigged it so that the first answers always should be the right answer. Um, and in general, you can see that that, that kind of black line is uh, the highest, or in this case, you know, second highest. Um, but in other cases, uh, it does, uh, if you look at this kind of case here, it makes an error where the B answer is a little bit uh, higher in this case, quite a bit higher in this case. Um, so we do get the network to kind of make a mistake. But in general, the network does quite well in terms of kind of showing us that the pattern of activity and the similarity that we think should, should obtain does obtain in the model. So in summary, we can see that just by learning about the correlational structure of the words uh, across a body of text, you really can extract some meaning. And so we do think this is an important aspect that's contributing to the overall knowledge representations in our brains about what, what words mean.